I don't know what he's talking about. I might not know what Zach's preaching on in January, but that song is awesome. <laughs> you pray with me. God, we've come today to be with our friends and our family, to remember who you are, to say thanks for your presence in our lives, to say thanks for the things that you have done and provided. God, we've come today needing to hear from you. So we ask this morning that you be true to the promise of your word, that it would speak, and it would speak life into our lives. And that, God, in the midst of that, we would be changed. We would be transformed by the truth of your word. So, Father, open our hearts and our minds this morning that we can hear from you. And we pray all this in Jesus' name and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So Jake was just your normal 17-year-old kid. Growing up in suburban North Carolina, taking three AP classes, running on the high school cross-country team, and participating in a model United Nations conferences across the U.S. Now Jake wouldn't ever admit it out loud, but one of Jake's biggest fears was failure. And it might be because if Jake was really honest, he'd look you in the eye and say he'd never really failed. Jake's parents knew he was high strung, he was driven, he was pushing for more. But nothing prepared them for that day in Jake's junior year when at 17 years old, it seemed like he just ran at 150 miles an hour into a brick wall. Jake's mom said he refused to go to school. He curled up in the fetal position and he just couldn't get out of bed. He'd scream, I just can't take anymore. And you don't understand. You see, anxiety is the leading mental health disorder in the U.S., according to the National Institute of Mental Health. One in three people struggle with, mental, with anxiety. So if you look to your right or to your left, one of you, based on statistics, is struggling with anxiety. Now I have to admit, if Zach had asked me to preach any other week of the Advent series, I could have given you personal story after personal story of bitterness or sorrow or conflict. If you know anything about me, the last one doesn't really surprise you at all. But anxiety, I need to ask for your grace because I'm going to do my best to walk us through this. But I need to ask you to assume the best in my intent, because I might unknowingly step on your toes. And not because I want to. Sometimes I want to. Not because I want to, but because I'm still learning. I'm not really anxious. And so as we walk through this, just assume the best as we walk this journey together this morning. One counselor defined anxiety as the overestimation of danger and the underestimation of our ability to cope. Anxiety has overtaken depression as the most common reason college students seek counseling services. 62% of undergrad college students admit to overwhelming feelings of anxiety on a regular basis. Our kids are growing up in a different world than you and I grew up in. One high school student said, there's always one more activity, one more AP class, one more thing to do so I can get into the top college. 
The pressure is relentless, and it's getting worse. And the difference about this generation and generations before is that when I felt pressure for school, it was because I didn't want to have to come home and tell mom and dad that I had gotten the grade I'd gotten on that chemistry test. Right? Like, I'm, I got to get into a school because at 18, I need a place to go so I can be out of here. That was my anxiety. But it was driven a lot by parental pressure and by pushing and driving and seeking. This is not the case today. This anxiety for this generation is coming as much from what's inside of them as what's outside of them. And so as we wrestle with this, we have to understand that anxiety is real. And it is affecting all of us, not just the younger ones, but the older ones. And it's interesting that anxiety really began to spike in 2012. Now, what's interesting about 2012 is that is the first year in American history that 50% of Americans owned a smartphone. Counselor and professional psychologist Dr. Gene Twin says this, But the twin rise of smartphones and social media has caused an earthquake of a magnitude we've not seen in a very long time, if ever. There is compelling evidence that the devices we've placed in young people's hands are having profound effects on their lives and making them seriously unhappy. You see, one of the other things that's different between my generation and maybe your generation and the generation of students that's growing up around us right now is that there's no disconnect. When I got stressed out at school, I went home. Excuse me. And I could unplug. Mom made dinner and my brother was there. But now we're constantly connected. Every time you push that button, there's a message. There's some alert. There's some notification. And we can say, oh, it's just affecting our kids. Well, my in-laws are going to watch this on YouTube later. And so I'm sorry, but they were here for Thanksgiving. And it's affecting the older generations just as much as it's affecting us. Just as much as it's affecting our kids. Just as much as it's affecting my generation. Everybody's on their thing, right? Whether it's Fox News or CNN or MSNBC or Facebook or Instagram or Snapchat, it never goes away. We can't disconnect from it anymore. There's anxiety about the future. That's where college and the drive to get into that comes from, but there's also anxiety about the past. There's anxiety that when we look back into our past, we begin to ask a lot of what-if questions. What if I'd never been in that relationship? What if I hadn't talked to my boss that way? What if I hadn't clicked that link on the computer? What if I hadn't gone into thousands and thousands of dollars of debt to pay for that education? And those what-ifs can lead us quickly spiraling into a hole that we can't get out of. Especially if those perceived fears are more real or significant than they actually are. A A close trusted friend who's also a counselor, told me that one key to overcoming anxiety is learning to live in the present. Not allowing the what-ifs of the future and the what-ifs of the past to become so dominant in our lives that we can't be in this place. But what if we could learn to live in the present, trusting God to take care of me in the moment? Her words sounded a lot like King Solomon's from the book of Ecclesiastes. So what do people get in this life for all their hard work and anxiety? Now, if you don't know Solomon in Ecclesiastes, he's like the wisest guy in the world, but he's not the most encouraging guy in the world. 
Their days of labor are filled with pain and grief, and even at night, their minds cannot rest. It's all meaningless. What do we get for all this anxiety, for all this fear, for all these struggles? We get a bunch of restlessness. Anxiety leads to restlessness. And maybe that's right where you are this holiday season. Maybe you think, you know, I'm not a really anxious person, but when Christmas comes around, I get pretty anxious. Maybe you are like the guy in the video talked about, and you're trying to figure out, how are we going to do Christmas this year? What's my kid going to say when there's not as many presents under the tree? Because it just has been a hard year. Maybe the demands of work and social life are so hard and so exhausting that there just doesn't seem to be any end in this season. And even when you get a minute to sit down and relax physically, mentally, there's never a stop. There's never any rest. Or maybe your biggest what if this season is what if Uncle Bill shows up at Christmas again? Because the last time you sat across the Christmas dinner table from Uncle Bill, it didn't go so well. And it left really awkward. And you haven't talked to Uncle Bill since last Christmas. And you don't know exactly how that's going to feel. When our worry or anxiousness, when we worry or are anxious, Could it be we've lost sight of God's promises in our lives and forgotten his presence? It feels as though we're living in darkness. And that darkness leads to isolation. That darkness leads to loneliness. And that darkness leads to fear. You see, because I'm not really that anxious, but as I thought about it, the the time I felt most anxious, some of you know I like to ride my bike, and in rural Indiana, I used to get up in the morning, and I'd go out on rides, and one day I thought, I'm going to ride to my in-law's house. It's like 60 miles away. It's going to be great. So I got up at like 5 a.m. in the morning. It was still dark. It was a little misty and really foggy, and I took off, and all of a sudden, you have this overwhelming sense come over you. If something happens to me right now, no one is ever going to know it. I'm in the middle of nowhere. It's me in the cornfields. And at that point, I'm not really afraid of people, but I am afraid of the unpredictable nature of wild animals. And I had just come to the end of a cornfield, and there's a sign that I can barely read, and as I get closer, it says, beware of, and the dog was at my side. Teeth bared, saliva dripping, he wanted to rip my leg from my body. No, it's not going to end in this was a poodle. His head was like the crossbar of my bike, and he is biting and trying to grab my leg. And all I can think in this moment is, if he gets me off this bike, they'll never find my body. And it's not made any better by the little GPS in my phone that says, turn right. No, that's his yard. He's familiar with that. I'm not turning and going that way. We'll reroute. I'll go out and drive longer. What if that was real anxiety? And we sit in the darkness, in the silence, alone and terrified. This Advent season, we have hope. Hope that Jesus has come. Hope that the Prince of Peace, the one who will restore peace to our lives, is here. Hope That the everlasting Father, the God who loves us more than we could ever hope to be loved, 
has come and lived among us as Emmanuel. We have hope that our wonderful counselor has actually shown up. And that in that, he's brought light to our darkest places. He's spoken truth into our deepest fears. In the book of Isaiah, we hear that they walk in the darkness. Those who walk in the darkness will see a great light, and those who are in the land of deep darkness, a light will shine. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5 says, In the darkness a light has come, and the darkness will not overcome it. Jesus says in John chapter 8, I am the light, and that all who follow me will walk in the light. Silence is the darkness of our anxiety. And we feel trapped. But this Advent season, Jesus has come to bring us hope. Hope that there is light in our darkest places. He's come to establish a community where we can walk alongside each other where we can know we're not alone because the wonderful counselor has come. And he's calling us. He's calling us, the church, gathered together in this building or in our living rooms to be a place of light and of comfort and of hope for those all around us. Some of you may have been reading recently on the front page Pause for a minute. On the front page of the Star Tribune, these articles about the decline in church attendance and the rise of the nuns and how the church is failing and fading. And though there are some controversial pieces to those articles, I think they give us some things to think about. But this week in the Opinion Ed section, Pastor Paul Harrington wrote this. Every picture of the church in the New Testament, is relational. Every picture of the church in the New Testament is relational. Jesus didn't come so we could remain in darkness, so we could remain isolated and alone and afraid. Jesus came to shed light and that light is shed in a community of people who love us and welcome us. Flaws and all. Struggles and hardships and everything. Who says, you can belong here. You can call this place home. We want to walk with you. We want to help shed light into your darkness. We want you to know you're not alone. And it's in that that Jesus also came to, and the hope of Advent is that we have a better future. We're waiting for it. Jesus never says in any of the Gospels, hey, come follow me and everything's going to go great. Hey, come follow me and you'll always have enough money in the bank account. Hey, come follow me and life's going to be easy. I'm pretty sure that if I gave the microphone to just about everybody here, we could tell a time about when life wasn't easy. Jesus didn't come as a baby in a manger. God didn't come as a manual God with us so that we could live the American dream. He didn't come walk shoulder and shoulder among us, die on a cross, and rise from the grave three days later so we could coast. 
His call to come and follow is actually a call to come and die. To die to ourselves. To die to this life. And in that death, to receive a hope of a future. I think that's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we of all people are to be most pitied. If my hope in Jesus is only for right now, is only for this place, is only for this life, Paul says, I'm really sorry. Jesus died on that cross. He rose again so that we could believe the promise that we will one day rise again. That one day all anxiety, all fear, all depression, all sadness will fade away. As we stand in the presence of the God who created us. Who knit us together. And who loves us. You see, as adults, we come into this Advent season we're not really waiting. We're hoping it gets over with. All the tree shopping gets over with. All the Christmas presents are bought. The family comes and goes. We can get our house back and our life back together. We can live on a budget again. But your kids, kids, you're waiting, aren't you? You're excitedly waiting. And as those Amazon packages show up on your front porch, you're really waiting, aren't you? And the excitement for that waiting is building because you know Christmas is coming and you know those Amazon packages, you know who they're for. And you don't know exactly what's inside that Amazon box, but you're glad it was there because that means there'll be something under the tree on Christmas morning. Our hope is in the waiting. The waiting that Christ is coming again. The waiting that this will all end. The waiting that it will all be over. And we will see God face to face. And we will worship. And the pain will end. And the fear will end. Because our hope is that there is a God who loves us. This hope that Jesus brings this Advent season is a hope that we are loved by God and that that love will never, ever fade and it will never change and it will never end and it doesn't matter what you've done in the past, what you'll do in the future. God stands with arms open wide and says, I love you. For God so loved the world that he sent his son to die that whoever believes could have eternal life the hope of Jesus come this Christmas is a hope that we are loved not because of what we've done not because of what we have said or thought or haven't said or haven't thought, not because of the label that we've put on ourselves or somebody else has put on us, but because God chose to. Because God is God and he says, I love you. And I love you enough to die for you. So that we can be in relationship, so that you can feel the love I have. So as we walk into this Advent season, the hope has come as Jesus came into the world. That hope has brought light into dark places. That hope has given us a future and that hope has provided love that will never change and never end. What's made me most anxious this week as I have worked on and worked through this sermon is that somebody here today is going to be dealing with anxiety 
And I'm going to miss say or you're going to miss hear that if you just prayed a little more, read your Bible a little more, came to church a little more often, your anxiety would go away. That's not what I want you to hear. That's not true. There are some of us, maybe who are anxious about dogs biting at our ankles as we ride our bikes in the dark, who maybe if those things we were, maybe if I was praying on my bike, I'd be a little less worried about those things. Those things can help. But for some of us, the darkness of anxiety is real and it is painful. And I know people who have struggled with this, who love Jesus and are pursuing him more than I am. And this fear is real. So what I do hope you hear today is there's a God who loves you. No matter how deep or how hard or how scary or how long you've been dealing with this bout of anxiety. And that he has a promise for you. And that he loves you. And he wants you to have hope. And for those of us here today who anxiety is not really our thing. When you're thinking, oh, this is great. Anxiety, good. I can go home. Check. Go eat dinner now. What about your friend? What about your neighbor? What about your family member? How would it change their life? How would it help them hope if we walked up alongside of them and put our arm around them? Said, hey, I don't know how long this journey is going to be. I don't know how dark it's going to get. I don't know how much it's going to hurt. But I'm going to walk with you. When you need somebody to listen, I'm going to be here to listen. When you need somebody to talk back to the fear in your head and to speak truth into your life, I'm going to do that in love. Because I don't want you to live in this darkness anymore. I want to bring light into your life because Jesus has come into my life and he's brought light. Because he keeps walking with me when I keep making mistakes and it's been a long journey with Jesus, but we're on our way back home. We're on our way to the end. And I'm going to walk with you. Because I want you to know there's hope. Will you pray with me?